Located at Columbia University, Gilana Jar is professor in both the Department of Religion and the Department of Middle Eastern and South Asian African Studies. Now, I first became aware of Gil Anajar's work early in my career through his editing of An Introduction to Acts of Religion. However, my first contact with Gil was in 2013 when he published a paper in Derrida Today organised by Gary Bannam called The Deconstruction of Christianity. It was a virtual introduction to him. His essay was titled Of Global Atinology. I can't pronounce it. Um, I copy edited his essay and I received from him a lovely and simple thank you I was struck by his thoughtfulness. In some ways, I took it as an act of encouragement that was greatly appreciated. But it was of global technology, an essay that attempts to show that the question, let us call it Derrida's Christian question, is therefore, what is Christianity, that led me to follow and read much of his work, of which I'm a great admirer. This is a fascinating essay that was followed in 2014 by his book, Blood, A Critique of Christianity. Among other titles, he is the author of The Jew, the Arab, A History of the Enemies, Semites, Race and Religion, um, and many others. Please welcome Gil Anajar. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Julian. Um, I, I don't know if, that's, if this has been said, but I do want to acknowledge the absolutely Herculean work that Nicole has been doing that I hope... Um, <laughs> and, you know, uh, Sam was talking to us about gage and engagement, and I think that we need to recognize the kind of engagement that is at work in order for all this to uh, happen. Um, you know, um, I, I feel like generationally I'm between the early Deridians and the late Deridians, and I was very intimidated by the early Deridians, and I'm very intimidated by the young Deridians. Um, so uh, I, I'll, I'll just say that uh, it doesn't happen to me too often now, you know, as I'm getting older, uh, to feel intimidated, but for some reason I do now, and uh, I, uh, I, I uh, if I may not coin a phrase, I beg for your forgiveness. So my title is Solicitude. Was Derrida a mama's boy? I would apologize for the inauspicious beginning, the irreverent question, yet taking as often and as multifariously as he surely did, the risk of adding a dubious exercise to the writer and his mother series, that's a quote from Sir Confession, was Derrida not exposing himself to such maternal or anti-maternal concerns? Was he not hiding or indeed manifesting, ostensibly displaying even, mommy issues? Camilla Adami apparently thought he behaved like a Jewish mother, which I will neither confirm nor deny. Um, and Gajri Spivak suggested that what one might find in Derrida, yet another, of, uh, another version quoting Spivak, a version of Freud's account of the right object choice, the son's perennial longing for the mother. So, was Derrida a mama's boy? Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> Still, let us posit that Derrida had a substantial, perhaps an even inordinate amount of things to say about mothers in general, about surrogate mothers too, and about his own mother in particular. Derrida did confess to having taken, somehow late in life, taken the side of his mother. I must have taken the side of my mother against my father, he told Elisabeth Rodinesco. Yet what I really want to ask is whether from Plato to Nancy, le mot mère n'apparaît pas, and more obviously from Rousseau to Freud and beyond, mothers can in fact be confined to restricted registers of life, of Derrida's life, and more formally to, formally to the biographical and autobiographical as circumfession and before it spurs the ear of the other, both lingering with Friedrich Nietzsche's mother, his own mother as a faceless figure of life and survival might suggest, right? It might suggest the autobiographical, that's the ostensible theme. Or even, right, continuing on where the registers of maternity and motherhood even to the psychoanalytical, as the postcard and the famous Forda scene would certainly indicate. 
Now, it seems easily granted that mothers belong, if they can and do belong, if they are allowed to belong, to a realm we might describe as personal and individual, intimate and emotional, sexual and or familial, if not exclusively private and domestic. Unless, of course, one jumps to mythological mothers or mattresses, Mother Earth, the so-called metaphorical mothers, in this case, the university, System de reproduction is what Derrida says, alma mater studiorum, or else to the reproduction of the species, modern nature. I've already mentioned psychoanalysis, whatever Freud's own personal and theoretical shortcomings on the question of the mother. But I could, indeed, I should mention the, let us say, contextual relevance for Derrida and for us of what is called reproductive politics, their ever heightened urgency. Derrida did, after all, ask why it was that those who claim to be on the side of life and therefore against abortion are the most ardent partisans of the death penalty. Renaming them militants of death, which I think is a phrase that should be used among, you know, uh, uh, in American political discourse if, you know, one thinks that it can get anywhere, Derrida might have added that they, the militants of death, also defend their freedom to bear arms, advocate for a militarized police, and for war or proxy war and full spectrum dominance as domestic and foreign policy, and for the curtailing of healthcare to boot. Pro life. No less urgently, I think, and keeping in mind the invocation of the maternal as a figure, the mother as a figure, we might expand the field of our attention, the contextual limits of Derrida's maternal concerns to figuration and to rhetoric, which is to say to language, and to that which we have come to call the mother tongue, a ubiquitous phrase for Derrida and deployed perhaps, most provocatively perhaps, in Monolingualism of the Other, where Derrida writes of the mother as the mother tongue, as well as of a mother who is madness, always a madness. The mother cuts quite a figure. She certainly is a figure too, linguistic and otherwise, if one that interrogates or indeed unsettles the very nature of the literal and the figurative, of the bodily at the invaginated edges of the linguistic. The mother unsettles the very nature of the natural, and therefore of the technological, the legal, and the political. For a very long time, and perhaps since the beginning of time, or at least since their took root, what Derrida calls the ineradicable phantasm of an identifiable mother on the basis of the testimony of the perceptible, end quote, the mother has been an impossible and non-figurative figure, even if many are insisting that she is also and primarily and literally literarily a body. The mother is a body, no doubt, a material and maternal body, although it might be appropriate to begin and wonder about the insistence of the singular and of the concrete in this context and others. Is the mother, is the maternal body one body? Are they not rather maternal bodies? Let us concede for now that the mother is a real material and maternal body, as opposed, we might think, to a technological prosthesis, an artificial womb set. About the maternal body, that maternal figure, one might still have some difficulty deciding whether it is to be concrete or abstract, real or fictional, preserved or abandoned. The name of maturity and emancipation remains, after all, separation from the mother. Is the mother, our mothers, to be protected or attacked, protected to the point of attack and even to the point of death? From the womb to the tomb, as the infamous expression has it, there is room to wonder about the distances we keep. And I do say we. Nicole Loro, always an inspiration in this and other contexts, proposes, I quote, the fiction of a summary typology. There would be some who save the mother, indeed who protect her, among whom Loro counts, and note that she also counts one mother and one mother only, the ancient Athenians, as well as Freud, right? They are those who want to save the mother. And then, Loro continues, there would also be those who make her terrible because they fear her. And here, Loro names none other than William Shakespeare. Still, or perhaps I mean therefore, the mother is also, as Derrida insistently reminded us, a fiction. Just like the father, the mother is a fiction, a legal fiction. 
I say all this primarily perhaps in order to agree with Jeffrey Bennington that, quote, one no longer has a very clear idea of what a mother is. The no longer is something I'd like to talk about, but not now. While being equally certain, right, so uh, I agree with Bennington, one no longer has a very clear idea of what a mother is, end quote, while being equally certain, which is to say uncertain, that it will be difficult to avoid confusion between that which can be called mother and what Bennington calls the habitual concept of mother, whatever it might be. A concern, shall I already call it a solicitude, for the mother on Derrida's part might raise a distinct set of questions. Let us posit this time and for the second time that Derrida is not a mama's boy, but rather that the mother is a mark, a Derridian mark, one of many, one or many, such as she, it, or they are inscribed on the surface of a text, perhaps a context, however indeterminate, that remains to be read. Is the mother text or context? Donald Winnicott, it might be worth remembering, referred to the mother as the environment. What becomes then of the mark or marks of motherhood? What is the space of the mother's inscription? Gayatri Spivak aptly evokes a rewriting of the social text of motherhood. But what are the limits of such text or field? What is in fact the field? What are the fields of maternal inscription or intervention? What are the foundations and the limits of the maternal into which we are welcomed, out of which we are thrown? It is a, mas a matter of hospitality in and after Derrida. Judith Still, by the way, Derrida and Hospitality has a lot of pages on mother, as of course does Derrida in the Seminar on Hospitality, uh, the volume one of which was published by Pascalan and, and, and Peggy recently. Uh, I'll come back to this a little bit. Allow me to begin again, and perhaps, I do say perhaps otherwise, we all know of Derrida's ambivalence and later maternal embrace of the term deconstruction. Nous devrons nous méfier de toutes les formes de reproduction, writes Derrida à propos de work laid out by and in front of deconstruction in Où commence et comment finit un corps enseignant. Some of us may remember that he had deployed another word, perhaps a different inscription, in the broader discursive event that came to be called deconstruction. I refer to the word, some mention it, solicitation, to Derrida's early use of the verb to solicit. In L'Écriture et la Différence, Derrida comments on the lability, the fragility of structures, and elaborates on the methodical threat to which structures might therefore be subjected by an operation to which he gives a name, a name he calls a Latin name. He calls it so, but gives it a French name. And to be perfectly precise, Derrida gives it two names, two French names, for one. Cette opération s'appelle, en latin, Soucier ou solliciter. Alan Bass here simplifies and only gives one word for two. This operation is called, from the Latin, soliciting. Derrida explains that the word or words mean, I quote, shaking in a way related to the whole, from solus in archaic Latin, the whole, and from quitare, to put in motion. But the French says, Peggy, this is for you, pousser. To push, push, pushing, or pushing out the whole, worrying it, shaking it, making it tremble. Partout, c'est la dominance de l'étang que la différence vient solliciter, différence avec un A, vient solliciter au sens où solicitare signifie en vieux latin, ébranler comme tout, faire trembler en totalité. Right, Sterida, in La Différence. Derrida neither endorses nor refutes what he describes here as a structuralist move or indeed push. He merely expounds on the structuralist solicitude and solicitation. Le souci et la sollicitation structuraliste. These two words or operations that would be repeating a solicitude and solicitation of being a historic metaphysical threatening of foundations. End of quote. Derrida goes on to date the development of such operations of such methods to what he calls epochs of historical dislocation when we are expelled from the site. Les époques de dislocation historique quand nous sommes chassés du lieu. In writing and difference then, the word and its cognates, 
solicitation, yes, are used descriptively uh, and also held at a distance of sort. Solicitation, the solicitation de l'ontothéologie, la solicitation du logocentrisme, for instance, seemed more explicitly endorsed in of grammatology, even if Derrida is clear that it is not possible, indeed, that it might be impossible to stop at that. Now, I want to underscore that it is Alan Bass who translated, and for good reasons, the French souci et sollicitation as solicitude and solicitation. This may have been a benign deviation or a bit of a poetical flourish carried by the pleasure of the assonance. It is certainly not inaccurate, even if concern might have better translated souci. Souci is, of course, the French translation of Heidegger's Zorg, care. Bass's translation is, however, remarkable for the attention it might have generated with regard to the proximity between the two French and also English words, which Derrida uses with significant frequency in Of Grammatology and elsewhere. Solicitation and solicitude. By the time Derrida returns to the matter of shaking, to the shaking of foundations and to the core and foundation, the shaking of earth and of body, the shaking and trembling with which he had concerned himself always and that has seized and occupied him out of obligation and out of necessity, Derrida will relate it to the fear and trembling that both, both St. Paul and Soren Kierkegaard associate with death. La mort donnée en durée de l'irremplaçable, the death given and endured of the irreplaceable, unsubstitutable, as well as la disproportion entre le don infini et ma finitude the disproportion between the infinite gift and my finitude. Derrida, who gave this lecture on trembling, comment ne pas trembler, just three months before his death, the lecture is dated July 17, 2004, also recalls that trembling is that which comes when carrying in the absence of ground, sol, and foundation, in the time of earthquakes and in the time of death, when the world is gone, when and where there is no world left, au moment où il n'y a plus de monde, où le monde perd sa fondation, où il n'y a plus de sol. Plus de sol, plus de fondation pour nous soutenir. At the moment when there is no more world, where the world loses its foundation, where there is no ground, no more ground, no more foundation to sustain us. It is there that one must carry, that one must porter. At the moment of death and after death, at the moment when the world is gone, I must carry you as Paul Celan's verse has it, to which Derrida returned a number of times. Ich muss dich tragen, I must carry you. But the German tragen, Derrida goes on to say, I quote, also belongs to the vocabulary of gestation, the mother who carries a child in her belly. The responsibility to carry, the rapport of the mother to the child, such is the obligation to which one is also subjected in mourning and carrying the dead other. It is the same absence of world that generates the obligation, the care and the carrying, the concern and the incorporation that is mourning, that substitutes for the foundation and the ground that have been shaken beyond all foundations and all ground. There where the mother is and carries, there where Derrida says the work of mourning consists in carrying within oneself to ingest, to eat and drink the dead in order to carry it within oneself, there is shaking and trembling. There is responsibility and, but Derrida does not use the word here, there is solicitude. Or to begin to make our way back to grammatology, there is maternal solicitude. I quote from Derrida's last unpublished book now, I quote from Bélier. Between the mother and the child, the one in the other and the one for the other, in this singular couple of solitary beings, in the shared solitude between one and two bodies, the world disappears. It is far away. It remains a quasi-excluded third. For the mother who carries the child, die Welt ist fort. Derrida speaks so poignantly of solitude, of the solitary but nevertheless shared solitude of the mother and child, he evokes the sometimes devastating solitude of the pregnant mother, of the single mother, abandoned in the world, by and to the world, and in the vanishing absence of world, of a sustaining and grounding world, when the mother is the world, the only world. 
Derrida alludes to that mother who carries and trembles, who makes us tremble, who solicits us and calls for our infinite responsibility, of that mother who is the very figure of solitude and of solicitude, of maternal solicited, solicitude and also of solicitation. Derrida himself, who made repeated use of the word solicitude, ce beau mot de solicitude, and of the phrase maternal solicitude, which he attributes to Rousseau, but never commented on the proximity of the two terms, solicitude, solicitation. Yet the end of the world, the shaking and trembling of all ground and foundations, the trembling of the earth and the trembling of mothers certainly occupied him. It made him tremble. It solicited him from beginning to end. This concern, this worry, this solicitation and solicitude is something Derrida carried, by which he was carried, shaken and shaking from the origin of geometry to the end of the poem, the last poem he wrote about, a poem about mourning and about caring, a poem, Nicolò might have pointed out, about mothers in mourning. Speaking of mourning and of the police, Derrida reminded us that the interpretation, I'm quoting um, uh, from Politics of Friendship, the interpretation of the community as fraternal must indeed be carefully dismantled. But it is possible, he, he went on, even with Freud, to interpret it otherwise as a sharing of a maternal thing, which precisely would not be substance, but sharing to infinity. Sorry, I was quoting, uh, I was quoting from Rogues, actually. Mothers in mourning, mothers and mourning, or as Gla has it, it is always the mother now one knows this word means to say nothing more than what follows, obsequences, remains after killing what it gave birth to, end of quote. Did Derrida speak and write of anything else, about anything else than maternal solicitude? Brilliantly elaborating upon Derrida's matrix, Elisa Marder, who knows something about mothers and about the mother in the age of mechanical reproduction, rightly averred that Many of Derrida's major writings from 1967 are haunted by the figure of the mother. Mother goes on to list an impressive number of later works that are heavily preoccupied with the concept, the figure, and the actuality of the mother. Indeed, with all the mothers of the construction, in Gla, in Postcard, in Circumfession, Archive Fever, Paper Machine, Faith and Knowledge, and Monolingualism of the Other. In that same essay, Mother joins Michael Nass who had earlier read the magnificent text Derrida dedicated to Jacques Trilling's book on Joyce. That book had offered the lengthy meditation upon which Derrida lingered on the difference between the mother and maternity, and on what might be described as a lack of difference, or at least a different pairing of matricide and infanticide. After Derrida, after Derrida's mothers, mother also returns us to the supplement of origin, to the originary surrogate, which is to say, to the maternal supplement, the dangerous supplement that a mother is and is not in of grammatology. Derrida's celebrated reading of Rousseau and of Levi Strauss's attends, of course, to the mother, to mothers and to no less numerous figures of birth, while also reminding us of other maternal activities, other maternal functions, which Derrida evokes as well, be these conception, formation, gestation, labor, and others. And though I'm focusing on the early part, right, the notion that the mother is the beginning, um, I think it's very clear that we're talking about uh, maternal functions, not just a maternal function, but maternal functions that, particularly if one includes la, uh, uh, la langue maternelle, um, much more, right, again, it's a question of the limits of the maternal field. So this, right, uh, um, everything that Derrida uh, said in Of Grammatology explains um, the very multiplicity and proliferation of mothers, I'm quoting Michael Nass here, uh, which Michael underscored, and that one can witness in Derrida as much as in Joyce. Nass himself is joined by Andrew Parker, who rightly pointed out that for his, for his part that Derrida repeatedly frames maternity as an ineluctable problem for philosophy in insisting that Derrida's signature contribution when it comes to the mother is that, I quote Andrew Parker now, 
to be a mother is structurally ineluctably to be more than one. And what is truly news about this recognition is that it should never have been news. Plus d'une mère. Such would be the Derridian news we have failed to acknowledge receipt of. Parker himself had learned from uh, Yolan Bogdan of an essay Derrida had, and I quote Bogdan now, published in Hungarian in 1997 under the title Qui as Anya, based on seminars he gave at École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris, I'm still quoting Bogdan, at the University of Pech, Hungary, between 93 and 95. Mark, I told you that it was uh, en Romanie, and I was wrong. It's both in Hungary. Um, uh, the title, Qui as Anya, Qui est la mère? Naissance, nature, nation. And I want to thank Peggy Kamov for sharing with me the otherwise unpublished session of Derrida's seminar, which served as the basis for the Hungarian lecture and book. These were seminars on hospitality, and they also informed Judith Still's book on the topic, one where the mother occupies a significant space. Surely, space, le lieu, is what Derrida is concerned with in this context in particular. For the entire seminar on hospitality, the first part of which has now been published, is Derrida says, as if a postscript to Plato's Timaeus. A postscript, one might say, to Cora, that mother which is not one. It is in this seminar that Derrida will speak again, and at quite some length, of the solicitude maternelle he had read in Rousseau decades earlier. Revisiting there as well, the, I quote, alleged unicity, singularity, irreplaceability of the mother. Equally significant in this seminar and almost everywhere else is Derrida's recurring engagement with the mother tongue, la langue maternelle, the trace of a mother and of a mother tongue, mère langue, a tongue mother, une langue mère who makes law. Derrida goes on. La mère langue, mère ma langue, langue ma mère, et la loi hors la loi. Or, as he puts it as well, commenting on Levinas, the mother tongue is and is not a ground, a foundation. It is certainly not to be reduced to le lieu d'origine, le lieu irremplaçable du sens. Is the mother ground or figure then? Is she text or context? A mark or a field of intervention? I put the question in these terms because I want to take the opportunity to register here a particular puzzlement that has accompanied me for many years. We were talking the other day about how many texts we each have actually read of Derrida, right? You all know the joke when some journalist walks into Derrida's library and says, have you read all these books? And Derrida says, no, no, I just read three or four, but I've read them really well. <laughs> um, so I, 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 I need to confess that the, if I can claim to have read a text by Derrida really well, I think, I think uh, my candidate would be signature event context. Um, and so since reading that text, and uh, I should pay respect, although I don't think that she will want to reciprocate to my teacher, Judith Butler, because it was in her seminar that I uh, read that text, um, I had a, a puzzlement um, that has accompanied me for many years. It concerns a verb which Derrida uses on a specific occasion, the occasion itself serving as the context for a sustained reflection on the concept or rather the non-concept of context. We're all familiar with the argument of signature event context. But there is a moment that has, as far as I know, not gained much notice there where Derrida explains that, I quote, every sign, linguistic or non-linguistic, that was my question for Sam if I had had time, linguistic or non-linguistic, spoken or written in the usual sense of this opposition as a small or large unity can be cited, put between quotation marks. Remember that citation, kitare, same, yeah? As Derrida himself will point out elsewhere, the very setting in motion of solicitation from the Latin citare is also shared by the word citation. It also means to cite. Every sign can break from its context, must be able to separate and break away from any given context. This emphatically does not mean, Derrida insists, that everything is a text and nothing but a text, that there is no context, that one can dispense with context, as too many vulgar readings have it, of il n'y a pas de hors text, that most untranslatable among Derrida's sentences. I mean, where did nothing come from? 
Indeed, Derrida would did ask us to rethink what it is that is meant and done by text, insist that no sign, no mark can ever function entirely out of context, but to, con to the contrary, that breaking away from a so-called original context, there are always many more contexts. Plus the context, if I wanted to be cute. Iterability, which I want, kind of, yeah. Iterability, citationality, the force of rupture that makes and breaks a mark as mark is not an accident or an anomaly. It is rather what enables the very functioning of the mark. For, I quote, what would a mark be that one could not cite and whose origin could not be lost on the way? End of quote. So far, so good. In reciting Derrida here, However, I have skipped over the site of my puzzlement. There Derrida says that the sign, the mark, can break with and break away from any given context. But Derrida also says that it can engender infinitely new context. Engendrer à l'infini de nouveaux contexte. It is this word engender that has puzzled me for many years. For how is one to understand the reproductive power of the mark its capacity to produce and reproduce a context, a place, a field of inscription. What is the nature or the culture of, of what is the effective intervention that writing is and effects in a constituted or reconstituted and no doubt instituted historical field, the champ historique constitué? What is between writing and engendering, between writing and one might say out of paleonymic necessity, maternity? Now, it would be an understatement, if also a simplification, to assert that Plato's pharmacy is a text about fathers. This has certainly been well rehearsed. Yet Derrida also points out the absence of the mother from the Platonic text. He does so on one momentous occasion, one that also raises question about the singularity of that very occasional context. Why only there, after all? Nothing is said of the mother, Derrida writes, in any case, before quoting Plato's Socrates, who evokes the loneliness and defenselessness of the Logos, that famous orphan deprived of the assistance of his father. And I was actually surprised to find that Barbara Johnson eagerly and above all inclusively translated its parent. And you all know the argument about how parenting is a nice idea, but you know, uh, when you know it's a little like Gandhi on. Western civilization. It's a good idea. Someone should actually do something about that. Um, this argument, one to which Derrida attended on a number of iconic occasions, is well known. As a living thing, logos issues from a father. The proliferation of a lexicon of generation and of reproduction, of procreation, contraception, and even of abortion, of family and kinship, all these does put the matter of birth at the center of Plato's and Derrida's text at the center of the question of writing. This prominence of birth resonates with Elisa Marder's argument, of course, but Derrida then goes on to interrogate his own assertion about the absence of the mother. He had already mentioned that if one looks hard enough, one might be able to discern her unstable form. Now, just a few pages later, he reiterates how he had remarked the apparent absence of the mother. Why apparent? And where to discern the presence absence of the mother? how to recognize the maternal field or figure. Let me venture that we might begin by looking at Socrates himself. For Socrates, it is well known, is the son of a midwife. He is an, himself an accoucheur. Barbara Johnson leaves the word untranslated. Derrida goes over the possibility and impeccably concludes that Socrates is neither father nor surrogate father, neither son nor brother. Is he then a mother? At the very least, Socrates is and is not a midwife. He is, as he himself says, Derrida quotes Plato here, someone whom heaven has constrained to serve as a midwife, but has debarred from giving birth. We might say that Socrates was or served as what Patricia Hill Collins famously called another mother. Something which Derrida had no less famously called, I think, a supplement. Another way to say that irreplaceable as he was, as every mother or other mother is, Socrates was one among innumerable supplements of mothers in an irreducible plurality. This is Derrida in Of What Tomorrow, For What Tomorrow. 
As he pursues his reading of Plato toward the thinking of writing, Derrida formulates a remarkable equation. He's describing a class of things which require, he says after Plato, that we define the origin of the, word, of the world as a trace. That is, Derrida immediately goes on, a receptacle. The trace would be a receptacle. It is a matrix, I'm quoting, a matrix, womb, or receptacle that is never and nowhere offered up in the form of a presence or in the presence of form, since both of these already presuppose an inscription within the mother. Is the womb a trace? Is the receptacle a mother? Barbara Johnson's translation seems to be faltering here as she confuses, perhaps, inscription and the field in an, and upon which it leaves its imprint, the text and its context. The French speaks of a constraint à définir comme trace l'origine du monde, c'est-à-dire l'inscription des formes, des chaînes dans la matrice, dans le réceptacle. Cora may or may not be pregnant. She or it may or may not be carrying or writing, inscribing. Neither literal nor metaphorical, she may well be a mother, and again, for strictly paleonymic reasons, what we cannot but call a mother. Nicole Loro does follow Derrida in suspending the maternal and other maternal metaphors generated by an around Cora. She also and further responds with a certain push or trembling with, this is for you again, Peggy, an impulsion to reread Plato's development of Cora, this third kind between the perceptible and the intelligible, difficult and indistinct. Amudros like Loro explains, like the scarcely legible letters of an archaic inscription which is receptacle and nurse. I'm still quoting Loro. Nature, which receives all bodies, impression carrier for everything, cut into figures by the objects that enter it and imprint themselves, this element in which one is born and that must be compared, Plato adds, to a mother, while the principle must be compared to the father. End of quote. Loro confesses that she displaces onto the mother Derrida's strong analysis of Cora insists that there is here a certain conception of the mother, one in which the mother simply does not belong to a couple of oppositions. This is law, where the mother would instead be a part, as it were prior to that moment when civic thought domesticated her as matrix, end of quote. Cora, just as the mother, is thus a site that is difficult to locate, the limits of which are hard to establish or even find, the nature of which, we might say, oscillates or trembles. Indeed, in her own striking reading of Plato, Emanuela Bianchi explains about Cora that, I quote, the motion she provides is rather a shaking, like a bad mother, or a menad in a Dionysian frenzy. The elements, Bianchi continues, are not yet patterned, ordered, and beautiful, but instead shake and are shaken in all directions by the nurse receptacle. End of quote. Cora shakes and oscillates. Cora trembles. How could she not? Between mothers, between the good and the bad mother, between text and context, between mark and field of inscription. One might add, after Adrian Rich, that she, the mother, trembles between experience and institution. Derrida said, it seems to me quite clearly, said that quite clearly, for if writing is engendering, if the mark can engender new context, then engendering is a form of writing and reproduction has long exceeded its sexual limits, its unfathomable limits. Like writing, but everything hangs on how we read this analogy, mothering has consequences among which are and I quote, the disqualification or the limit of the concept of the real or linguistic context whose theoretical determination or empirical saturation are strictly speaking rendered impossible or insufficient by writing, end of quote. Or by mothering. Is the mother writing? Is writing carried or carrying? Is it caring, nurturing, or else is it killing? Is it or does it need, if not a father and a janitor, at least a midwife and another mother? Is writing on the mother? La feuille de papier blanc devient le corps de la mère, Derrida renders Freud. How to write the mother? And how does writing mother? How does the mother differ and defer? Writing is here solicited, no doubt. It elicits solicitude. You could say that it shakes. It trembles and makes tremble. 
Writing trembles and oscillates as and like a mother who is always more an other than a mother, more than one mother. As mothers write themselves onto the world as reproduction takes place, the field of its inscription, the reproduction of society, Niccolo has it, occurs in and beyond the sexual, in and beyond the familial, in and beyond the civic and the political. Put another way, there are only contexts without any center of absolute anchoring. In case this is not clear, this is my objection to the fact that when we talk about abortion, we talk about reproductive politics rather than as politics. And I think that's what I'm learning from Derrida, yes? Now, we might think of these as the unsaturated fields of the maternal or as maternal difference, the difference mothers make and unmake, or else it might be that, I quote, to sublate the natural or physiological evidence of motherhood into a prospective historical or psychological continuity is the idealist subtext of the patriarchal project. End of quote. Which might mean, if I understand Spivak, whom I was just quoting, that Derrida was in fact a mama's boy. But is there a text to the social text of motherhood? Mothers could be everywhere, in Derrida and elsewhere. Everywhere there is a somewhere, il y a la mer, il y a les mères. Thank you. Do I stay here? Yeah. Oh. All oh, right, the one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd like to thank you for such a wonderful, brilliant talk. It was really fascinating, really fantastic. All the way from Australia, it's a Kunawara Cabernet Sauvignon. Oh, and it's, cool. And thank it's an Australian you, chocolate. So and thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> We will take some questions. David. Uh, Mike. Oh, sorry. I'm not with it today. Bit time. So, Gil, thank you very much. This was fabulous, if not fantastic. Um, so, I have a, just a couple of comments. I don't really have a question, but um, two things in terms of the the mother, the extent to which you 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 mind that resource, if you like, um, to go down through. Uh, to, to, to have it work for us as the trembling that is somehow uh, making everything happen in Derrida, right? Um, and and it, what came to me at the same time as you were talking was the idea of, of the mother as as yeast, right? As, as yeast, the mother the mother that you you have to begin a loaf of bread to, uh -huh. to the leavening, right? Right. Um, which which one could also consider as a as a type of originary trembling so so that, that just uh, mm. to to uh, express my admiration um, for the network that you uh, uh, evoked and solicited uh, but ju just one other thing this is a bit of a, a downer um, <laughs> because there is uh, if, if you go to the um, uh, the French uh, uh, etymology for solicité they they go precisely to citare citare and in in Latin, but if you go to the OED, they go to another verb uh, siere, mm -hmm. uh, which, which has as past participle situs, and and so there's a strange disjunction where um, I mean I didn't haven't gone into it deeply, but where the the the, the English want to take uh, as as their because Sierra has a very strong sense of trembling, closer probably to what um, what Derrida wants yeah. uh, than does Chitare. So I don't know if you if you there's into another, that I, I, right now. I don't remember where, but there's another moment where Derrida traces the Latin, and he actually uh, he does, traces he does give to that Sierra. Right, right. right. Um, I mean, one of the so, yeah. sorry, no, just to, to finish, and uh, uh, one of the the places where he is most extensively using solicite is in the. The Heidegger seminar from 1964, of course. Mm. Um, right. But anyway, thanks. Yeah, thank you. I mean, again, it's the it's the fact that the uh, and I don't think I actually said that, but the adjective that Derrida um, um, opposites to solicitude 
in most of the occurrences that I found is maternal. So, uh, um, so it's the um, it's the kind of you know originary moment of solicitation then that gets coupled with solicitude, and which is where I got uh, uh, started. Um, but yeah, thank you. Karen. Karen. Uh, thanks for a wonderful talk, Gil. Um, I, I was very fascinated by the motif you put into play by talking about Tragen. Uh, and because for me, it reminded me of moments when I've seen the word Trägheit in you know, Freud's writing or in Bloch's writing about anachronism. Um, and, you know, Trägheit is, you know, the other side of solicitude, perhaps, because it's about exhaustion and the exhaustion of caring things uh, and <laughs> the exhaustion of solicitude, right? Um, which, you know, is part of... Uh, a nexus of connotations that we associated with, we associate with the idealization of motherhood. Um, because of course, every, every figuration involves some sort of prior um, idealization. Um, and e that idealization might be unconscious because uh, it's something we absorb through being thrown into the world as Heidegger might say. But, um, you know, it's, it's Trägheit that interests me because of the massive amount of expectations that are exhausting for mothers, I think in particular, and maybe above all American mothers, although that's a risky thing to say, <laughs> but just because of the culture of hatred that surrounds motherhood here. Um, and so I was wondering if you could comment on the sort of silent motif of exhaustion um, that is part of this economy of or the figural logic of motherhood. And, you know, I, I feel like in Berida, those moments of the destruction of energy, perhaps, you know, uh, hearkening back to our conversation yesterday, the destruction of energy right. that takes place through effective with an A labor. Um, Thank you. It's a fantastic question. Uh, um, so if, if I make with David here, uh, here comes a downer. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, I tried to indicate that, although I should say that it's true that I didn't find it very strong in Derrida, the, um, uh, with the trembling and the shaking, right? The seismological, um, which is also the worrying, which is kind of destructive. And there is that without, again, going into the biographical, there is abs absolutely something exhausting in the worry, right? Um, uh, to which, you know, uh, to the extent that I can uh, claim to have had some familiarity with uh, Derrida, um, was, I think, visible to anyone. Um, so that there's a negative part to solicitude, solicitation, right? The shaking and the trembling. Um, uh, I tried to register that as much as I could. I should say, um, so this is, I don't think this is going to be part, but I'm, I'm working on a book on mothers. And so when I asked, is Derrida a mama's boy, it's really... A question that I'm asking myself. Um, am I, is there another way to understand myself if I'm writing about mothers and about my mother um, as other than a mama's boy? There is something which has been written about by many feminist philosophers, many political philosophers, uh, and I, which I found in Adriana Cavallero in the version that struck me. And it is the moment when Hobbes describes that in the state of nature, as it turns out, there are many sovereigns. Now, as far as I can tell, nobody has remarked on the fact that Hobbes describes a situation of plurality of sovereignty. The sovereignty that he speaks of there, it's dominium and imperium, is the sovereignty of mothers, which, just to give you a preview, will be the title of my book. Um, and, um, and there, the, uh, Hobbes is very clear that the sovereignty of mothers is utterly tied not to pregnancy, gestation, etc., but to the fact that the mother has preserving power, and I hope you can hear the Benjaminian echoes, yes, preserving power, 
that preserving power is absolutely linked, although it is not the same as destructive power. And I hope you can hear Benjamin there as well. Um, the fact that destructive power is a power that is singular, that is not to be collapsed onto, um, uh, onto other kinds of power, and Foucault kind of did us a disservice by only helping us think about power as enabling, yes, um, or a repressive, but there is a form of power which Benjamin says is a singular power, which, as you remember, he puts on the mytho mythological side, on the mythical side, the preserving, founding and preserving, talk about mothers, right, Niobe, um, and on the completely different end, destructive power, which is divine, yes? Hobbes attributes, and I haven't seen that much discussion of destructive power as a particular kind of power. Uh, and Heidegger is fascinating, and I tried to write a little book on Derrida and Heidegger on the status of the word destruction, which, you know, Heidegger brings in the Latin destruction in order to just go like, but I don't mean anything bad by it. And everybody goes, well, you know, you readers of Heidegger, you just don't understand Heidegger. When he says destruction, he doesn't mean destruction. And I'm like, well, he didn't have to use the word, you know? Um, so, and Derrida jokes about that in, in Postcard, where he goes like, we fooled them. We made them think that destruc destruction doesn't mean destruction, right? Um, so destructive power is what Hobbes attributes to the mother, yes? I would go much further than exhaustion. I would want to reflect not on the cliche that men have this womb envy, but also that the power to kill is derivative of the mother. Yes, you will have noticed, of course, that I say nothing about sexual difference. And I'm trying to stay within the confines of what I see to be one feminist imperative, but there are others, um, which is to make the distinction between woman and mother, which is both a terrible thing to do and also a necessary thing to do. Um, so when I speak about mother, I'm trying to uh, speak of something that I think is, I don't know if both earlier and later. Um, but again, I would go much further than exhaustion. Um, it's a strange thing to me, uh, and you know, Peggy gave us uh, a magnificent uh, example of Derrida's reading. Derrida mentions Hobbes and the, uh, and the mother in Hobbes. And he just, so to two, he doesn't say anything about it. And I found that extraordinary. Because when I found that lecture, the key as Anya, where Derrida talks about the unicity, the non-unicity, non-singularity of the mother, I was just blown away. I was like, I mean, he's been everywhere, right? Like, there's no question that, I don't know, that comes into my mind that I cannot go to Derrida and go like, oh my God, he's like said everything there is to say. So on this particular moment, I was very surprised. He mentions it and doesn't say more. Um, and I think that that's where we have to go. And some, again, so in the discussion about abortion, the question of infanticide, yes, the question of the sovereignty of mothers is I think something that should be uh, um, you know, on the table. And again, pro-life, pro-choice, not convincing choice is already capitalist and you know, it already belongs to that side. So uh, it's already a, 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 lost, um, a lost argument. So something else is necessary and it seems to me that there, there is uh, a lot of potential there, you know, if there is time, which I'm not convinced there is. But thank you for your question, it's uh, really crucial. Is there time? Uh, thank you, Gil. Um, that was moving and funny and, and fun, uh, but also a downer. <laughs> as, um, ending on exhaustion. Um, and I, I'm, I hesitate to ask this question because it's, it's really sort of um, not, not well um, thought through. But uh, I started thinking about it actually during Thomas' lecture this morning, um, when he had that quote from Agamben listing the abstractions that, um, and ending with the term woman. Mm. 
Um, and you just partially responded to the non-question I began to formulate when you said you were very careful not to mention woman or distinguish mother and woman. Um, but I, here's the kind of inchoate question, which is to ask you if you thought, and you clearly have because you did make some uh, clear allusions to a current context of the uh, post-Roe uh, anti-abortion um, event that is happening now. And, and um, a symptom, I'll call it a symptom, I'm not sure what it is, but many people have begun to notice the disappearance of the term woman from the talk about abortion. A little bit the way Barbara Johnson <laughs> kind of erased mm. father and substituted parent. Right. Um, that they're, they're, the phrase is a pregnant person. So it's persons who are pregnant and who get abortions or not. Um, and of course there's a larger, one could extend this to um, to gay parenting, to um, families that are constituted otherwise. Right, than, and transgender. And, uh, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the politics of this disappearance of the term woman from this ambient discourse is not at all self-evident, perhaps. Uh, absolutely, and uh, that's why I said, on the one hand, it's essential to, keep, to preserve the distinction, and on the other hand, it's a terrifying thing to do. Exactly. One of the most terrifying books I've read in recent years is a book by Jennifer Dudna, who received the Nobel Prize for having discovered CRISPR, uh, which is this basically um, mechanism that enables to disconnect and reconnect DNA however the scientists uh, would like. And I think, that it's very important to, uh, to take into consideration that um, the artificial womb is coming, yes? And it's a disaster that I don't think can be avoided. I mean, according to Shulamit Firestone, it's everything that feminism has worked for, right? We need to remember that. Uh, um, there is a feminist project that says, why should mother be confined to their biology just because they can carry a child? So let's get rid of that. So where the desire is coming from is really a difficult question. So that the uh, technologization and mad technologization of and scientification of uh, uh, artificial wombs is on its way. I'd be surprised if it doesn't exist. Uh, we hear, obviously, because it's, you know, everything bad happens elsewhere. It's only in China. Um, um, nothing bad ever happens here, yes? Um, but the fact that it's already on the way, I think is something that to take into consideration, both because of what it uh, threatens and also because of what it promises, according at least to some uh, uh, structure of desire. Um, what to do with that? Uh, uh, I think to recognize the, uh, the, the force of rupture of iterability is necessary rather than go like, no, it cannot happen. It doesn't happen. Uh, and I was saying how much I appreciated recently reading Penelope Dodger's uh, uh, Foucault's Children. And one of the amazing things that happened in this book, and there are many amazing things that happen in the book, is that she almost, Penelope almost never uses the word mother. She only uses the word woman. And it's fine, but it's also a problem. So um, I don't think there's a, an easy way out except to register uh, that um, <laughs> I almost feel like calling the ontological difference, uh, um, right? But um... we have okay, I'll, I'll, we have somebody online, and then I'll go to Mark. We have we have time. Um, this is from Silvana in Italy. And she says, wonderful lecture, thank you. I was expecting it to be, and you responded to my expectations. Through your talk, I was remembering Derrida's The Death of Roland Barthes. At the end of this text, Barthes' mother being evoked but never presented in his camera. It is her invisibility that, according to Derrida, allows the metonymity of her figure. Does the reference make any sense to you and your solicited talk? I lost my mother long ago. Yeah, actually, that's a, a, a wonderful reminder. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I've, I've resisted 
falling into uh, Bart at this point uh, because there, there's also volumes to uh, write, and Derrida picks it up. But I'm very gr grateful for the reminder. I, I, I can't answer it. I think that it's, part, it, it certainly follows on, on your question, Peggy, which is, which is, w what is the visibility, invisibility of women in relation to mother? What is the visibility of the mother? What does it do to women, etc., and, and to all kinds of other questions? Um, uh, it's a great reminder. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Mark. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Gil, for your wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. And um, I have a question. I, I would like you maybe to, to come back to what I would call the, the black side of solicitude. Because solicitude, as you know, even in, in French, there is no solicitude that has not the risk to be excessive and uh, then being excessive to be a shocking, a strangling. And the shocking and the strangling, they always contain um, the idea of a depth. And uh, that's, uh, that's exactly the link that I would like you to, to focus on, the link between solicitude and the depth it creates. And it seems to me that talking about the figure of mother, uh, enclosed in mother tongue and things like that, and all the political and philosophical discourses in the 18th century. I'm thinking on Herder, for example, and many others, and all the political and intellectual discourses. So that uh, uses the figure of the mother. Um, it's always to um, claim for something, for something that you, like a depth. Okay, you have a depth into your country, not because it is your fatherland, but because it is the, far, the land of your mother tongue and you have drinking your mother tongue as the milk of your mother and so on, and you have a debt and, okay, that was my question. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I don't think, uh, um, if I may, um, um, could Peggy again? Um, I don't think I'm competent <laughs> to answer uh, the question, but I will say uh, I will say that I think that part of the problem, and and this is a problem even in my own presentation, um, that there's such a tendency to think of the gift of life as something that happens once, which of course is uh, uh, is where the problem begins, right? Um, um, and that something happens to debt if one recognizes um, its repetition, uh, its reiteration over the course of time, right? So one, I suppose, easy way to, uh, to explain this would be to say that even though Rousseau did not know his mother because she died uh, uh, when he was born, um, the, um, the presence absence, the constitutive uh, uh, side, if you'd like, of, of the mother is a permanent trace, yes? It's not something that defines a beginning. It's something that defines everything. And I think, but that's just an intuition which may be completely, completely wrong, again, because I don't have the, um, the uh, competence. It seems to me that something happens to that if one doesn't consider it uh, as as uh, 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 an, an exchange or even as a unilateral gesture that happens once. Something happens over the, uh, uh, over the fact of iteration. One of the things, uh, I just go full um, uh, autobiographical, uh, one of the things that uh, concerns me um, is that insofar as I speak, it's been 20 years that I speak every day to my mother, right? Every day. Um, it makes no sense for me to say, I owe her my life. It makes perfect sense to me to say, uh, if I make one of Derrida's favorite joke, I am nothing without her, right? Um, every day. There is no way I can, uh, so I, as, I, you know, in this day and age, if I were to say, I am a mother, I am my mother, uh, you can imagine all the uh, cultural appropriation or, or, or sexual appropriation that would be at work. And on the other hand, 
I simply do not know how I can speak about myself and not recognize that, of course, I am my mother, right? And this is not, this is, uh, it seems to me, something else than debt. It is something that is constantly uh, um, sh shaping, un uh, also undoing, yes? Uh, there is absolutely a destructive power. Um, I, I'm not gonna say too much about my mother, who's an amazing person. But also, uh, and, and there's all kinds of interesting things that happen, yes, when you start talking about mothers. Uh, um, and then you mention you're Jewish, and then people just, you know, uh, lose it. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, because it's only Jewish mothers who, uh, uh, who, who care, um, or, or don't care. But, um, but I think that something happens to that um, if one uh, gets out of the cycle by virtue of repetition, Repetition with the difference, but I may be completely wrong, but that's just the intuition. Yeah, okay, I understand your point, but the fact that this uh, debt is not linked to the birth, but that this death is repeated day after day during all the life and stuff, it doesn't change the fact that this debt may be all along the life a shocking and a struggling. And it doesn't change even because I was not, I was more thinking about the political uses of the figure of the, of the mother. And uh, um, because it's something very, very present in the literature of 18th century, 19th century, it is a very a, a, a strong link between nationalism, the construction of the debt the you have into nationality. your country, and this all political uses of the figure of the mother. And then, it is a debt repeated all the long life, day after day, and it has not to do just with birth. So what I would ask is whether that which is repeated is in fact a debt, right? Because if you say it's debt that is repeated, then you've already uh, kind of answered the question. But if that which is repeated, right? Because part of the question is, so what is, what is it? I mean, life as if we know what it is, yes? So what is it that is repeated? I would rather call the mother rather than, an, or at that level, mothers, right? Plus d'une mère is, uh, uh, um, is um, I think, raises a question as to how we think of that. Um, now, as to the political uses, um, I'll just say, um, you know, it's a little like the way in which people talk about um, uh, the symmetry of violence, like whoever is oppressed will become the oppressor, or, you know, we all murderers at heart, or we all racists at heart. I like that, but I'd like to try to have, let me put it this way, the World Bank in Tehran and the UN in Shanghai, just to see how similar it will be. But as long as people tell me, you know, men have been doing violence to women for centuries upon centuries, but women would have done the, the same thing if they could have, just like Native Americans would have taken white people into concentration camps in the south of France. I don't think so. And I'm happy to try. So yes, there is a deployment of the mother in the 19th, 18th, 19th century as a political resource. I think that political resource hasn't been exhausted. And I'd like to see what happens if we went with that for a moment. Um, I might be wrong, but again, time is short, so we might as, try, might as well try something different. We have uh, two questions. Um, first, Stella, and then Elizabeth, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. I'm sorry up the back there, but maybe you can talk to Gil afterwards if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gil, for a very interesting and rich talk. I'm a little, I have, um, trepidatious about asking this question. Um, <clears throat> when you use the phrase, uh, is she text or is she context? A phrase you use a few times. It evokes for me a kind of abstract generality that I find a little bit problematic. And I see a line, uh, the mother, the maternal, motherhood, which are allied with mothers. Now, you just spoke very uh, elliptically to that distinction. But I wonder whether Derrida's critique of the animal might be also germane to the phrase the mother. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think you've already started to point at an answer to this question. I'd like to invite you to say more. 
Right. Uh, thank you. So um, you, you, uh, the 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 force of habit being what it is, uh, one ends up speaking of mother in the singular. When uh, I mean, in fact, some of the lengthy conversations in the morning with my mother has been to explain to her that she is many. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, um, and and so plus uh, d'une mère, right? So at some level, this is the beginning point, but it's a hard. It's a hard one to iterate and reiterate, but I think it's absolutely uh, essential. Um, now, I, as with regard to abstraction and abstract generality, um, you know, um, um, difference is timing, spacing. Um, and at which point are we abstract, at which point are we concrete, is part of the problem. Um, you know, I find it amazing to read anthropologists and, and people who, who say, look, it's different everywhere. And yet, when they do a collection on mothers everywhere, it's very different. But the collection is about mothers, right? I mean, it's a, it's a banal point, but it's as if we know where to look. And part of the issue would be, how do we know where to look, right? And again, that's why it seems important, both to keep the pearl, even though it doesn't really exonerate anything, um, to try not to be abstract and, uh, um, and, to, um, um, and to recognize that there are certain structures, one might call them quasi-transcendentals, that are operative. Um, and, you know, this is, uh, this is a thin line. It's not very uh, satisfying. I have to say, I was kind of surprised to hear Sam reiterate the fact that Derrida was a philosopher of language, when precisely in signature event context, that seems to be the very, very clear uh, um, uh, question, right? Signature event context. So we're never only talking about language. Um, and the difference between the signifier and the signified is also the difference between the sign and the referent. And so we are, we are struggling over the abstract and the concrete. And I think that, uh, um, I, I, you know, I'm not so optimistic as to think that I can succeed, but it seems to me that there's a level of the conversation that seems important to, uh, uh, to conduct. And I, I recognize I'm taking a certain risk. Um, I mean, here, not so much because I'm quoting Derrida, yes. Um, but, um, and there is somewhere we, I think he says, you know, the plural doesn't really enable us. It's not like, if not, if you pluralize being, you're not out of metaphysics. Yes, it's not enough, um, but but the work needs to be done. It seems to me uh, there, so it, very important and and very scary. Um, but um, thank one, you. One last question. Yeah, thank you, Gil, for that lecture. I have a question. It's a genuine question, um, uh, out of also curiosity. Uh, a lot of people say that. Um, in response to Derrida's violence and metaphysics, Levinas wrote otherwise than being or beyond essence. Mm. And as you know, um, you know, in Totalité et Infini, it's a very patriarchal book, as it were, whereas he then introduces in otherwise than being uh, maternity. And very interestingly, he describes maternity in connection to persecution, but in a footnote, he links it directly to rachamim, which is, as you know, compassion. And rachamim in Hebrew, as it is in, 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 in Arabic, is the plural of the word rachamim. 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 And so, um, and it's worth pointing out that compassion as rachamim, as the movement of the womb, is not at all limited to women, but um, so I, I always thought that figure extremely interesting. Mm. Um, so my question, I guess, it's, it's perhaps a little vague, is uh, to your knowledge, has Derrida ever picked up on that concept of maternity in Levinas? With regard to Rachamim, because I, I, I would think it's a very, you know, potentially productive yeah. um Path. I don't remember, and I was uh, looking recently at Lisa Gunter's book, uh, uh, and I don't think she mentioned it, which of course doesn't 
provide a guarantee. I don't know if anyone remembers. Uh, I uh, I haven't found that, uh, uh, but I'll have to look again, particularly at uh, at um, uh, as, uh, on ce moment, dans ce, uh, um, uh, I have to look at that again because I, I think there might be something there. Also in adieu, there might be, but I, uh, uh, right now it doesn't come to mind. Um, but it's, uh, there's all kinds of amazing things that happen, you know, <laughs> good and bad, if I may put it this way. Uh, but thank you for the Levinas reference. It's a, it's a very important as well, yeah. I'm afraid we've, we're out of time. Um, could we thank Gil once again for his wonderful, brilliant talk? Thank you. Thank you. Great questions.